Well, buckle up because in this episode of the Rocks of Utah, we're going to be looking at the Jurassic Morrison Formation. Now I'm a bit nervous about doing a video on the Jurassic Morrison Formation. And the reason being is that it's such a well-studied uh, rock layer here in Utah. And that means that lots of people have actually worked on Morrison. I have lots of colleagues who have done their dissertations on the Jurassic Morrison Formation. Oh, hang on. Four wheeling. Got a little bumpy there. <laughs> and so today we're going to be looking at the Morrison. And um, although I've worked in the Morrison, worked on a couple digs in which we were surveying the Morrison and looking for dinosaurs. Um, there are people out there that their whole careers have been on the Morrison Formation. Oh, hang on, it's gonna get a little bouncy up here. So this road that we've been hiking down, um, I was gonna hope to get to a, to a locality, but uh, the last season has been really bad on the roads and it's washed out our road. So I'm having to hike and I think it's a little too far because that ridge over there is a cool site um, where I know that there's some dinosaur bones, but I know some other places we could find some dinosaur bones. And we're gonna go take a look at those dinosaur bones. Um, so we can't get over there because it's too far to walk and the road is washed out. And I don't think I'd be able to get over those ravines that have washed out. So this is the Morrison Formation. It may not look like a typical Morrison exposure, but it is. What this represents is a, well, we can observe it. It's a conglomerate um, full of chirp pebbles, which are these rounded pebbles in here. And this particular rock layer was formed from an ancient river. And just like rivers today, all of these pebbles are well-rounded, meaning that they've been tumbled in water. Now, what's interesting about this is that it's just full of fairly um, coarse grained chirp pebbles. This is something you see kind of typically when you're fairly close to a mountain range. For example, if you go down into Mississippi at the end of the Mississippi Delta, you're not going to find very many big, huge um, cobbles or pebbles like this in the river. You're going to find mostly mud. So what this is indicating is that during the Jurassic, there was a mountain range here in Utah. Now this mountain range is an interesting one. This is the severe orogeny. The orogeny, of course, means mountain building event. So the severe orogeny had gotten kicked off by the Jurassic by the breakup of Pangaea. So the North American continent during the Jurassic was heading towards the west and leaving away uh, Europe and Africa and with the Atlantic Ocean opening up. And as it did that, it was riding over those Pacific plates and that caused a mountain range to bump up in the western part of Utah. Here in the eastern part of Utah was a place where all these rivers coming out of the mountains were depositing these uh, pebbles and, and uh, conglomerates. And so this unit here, we can see some bedding, meaning that we've got some cross bedding going on. As you move up, you get less pebbles. So this is very characteristic of a large fluvial system that was draining. Now, not this is very atypical of the Morrison. Many places in the Morrison, we're going to get what are called paleosoils. And let's take a look and see what those look like. All right, here we have a paleosoil. And paleosoils are these variegated, what they're called variegated beds. That means that they're multicolored. We have these wonderful purple beds. This is what characterizes the Morrison, is these purple colors. Anytime you see a purple and white striped formation, especially in the American West, it's probably the Morrison formation, um, especially this purpley color. And what these are, are basically soil horizons, ancient soil horizons. We have the C and the B horizons. Those are the lower horizons uh, in, in soils even today. So there were plants that were living um, here and 
there were trees and all sorts of things. And as you would go down into the soil horizons, you would get into the iron oxide rich um, B horizon, which is the purple horizons. And then below that would be the C horizons, uh, which are white in color because they're more enriched in calcium carbonate. So they tend to be a whitish color. Now, if we dig into these things, we'll find all sorts of cool things like rhizoliths. Those are basically the, the leftover trace fossils of, of tree roots. Um, we'd find burrowing structures, all sorts of stuff like that. That means it was biologically an active area. So these beautiful variegated striped purples are what characterizes particularly the upper member of the Morrison Formation. So one of the interesting things about the Morrison was that for many years it was believed that any of these sort of variegated purpley beds going up to a big change in lithology, a sandstone, uh, was the Morrison Formation. In fact, if you look at a lot of geological maps of this area in eastern Utah, uh, the Morrison basically starts at the end of the Cretaceous Dakota or uh, Naturine. Uh, Naturita uh, formation, which is what it's called now, but I always think of it as the Dakota sandstone. And below that would be lumped into the Morrison. Starting in the oh, 1970s, 1980s in particular, uh, people discovered uh, that the dinosaurs in the upper part were very different, and when they got dates back, they were around 100 million years ago instead of 150 and that became known as the Cedar Mountain Formation. Now the Cedar Mountain Formation varies quite a bit in thickness and its contact with the Morrison Formation is oftentimes very difficult to uh, discern in the outcrops and the reason for that is that the Cedar Mountain Cretaceous rocks look very similar to the Morrison Jurassic rocks. They both are terrestrial deposits, they both have um, paleosoils, um, they both kind of have the same sort of color and shape. If you get far enough away, you'll notice that the Cedar Mountain Formation tends to be grayer and is a lighter color than those rich purple beds of the Morrison Formation. So I'm actually probably, where I'm at right now, I think I'm in the Cedar Mountain Formation. Um, so I've crossed over that. What we call this, this contact between the Cedar Mountain Formation and the Morrison Formation is a paraunconformity or a paraconformity. So it's an unconformity in which the beds are parallel to each other. And that makes it very difficult to discern that contact. Now the Cedar Mountain's really interesting because its thickness varies quite a bit. And so there's quite a differences in thickness of the Cedar Mountain Formation. The Morrison Formation has this erosional top to it. And so we're missing about 50 million years um, of that early part of the Cretaceous um, when just things were getting eroded away. So the Morrison formation itself is kind of unique in that it gives us a glimpse but a very limited glimpse into the world of the Jurassic and the Cedar Mountain gives us a glimpse into the world of the Cretaceous but also a very limited glimpse of that. These two units, the Morrison formation and the Cedar Mountain formation, are where probably 90 5% of the dinosaurs in Utah are found. So our dro drone uh, crashed this morning. Um, looks like there's some structural damage here, here. Probably went in like that and it busted off our, our camera. That sucks. So one of the interesting things about the Morrison Formation was basically a debate that's erupted um, whether the Morrison Formation represented a wet, marshy, boggy environment or whether it represented a very dry or arid environment. One of the interesting things in the Morrison is if you go down into the lower member, what's called the Tidwell member of the Morrison Formation, you get rocks that kind of look like the rocks behind it. Well, 
this is the Tidwell member. And what's interesting about the lower part of the Morrison Formation is that it has these wonderful sandstones. And if you look, you can kind of discern, it's a little difficult to see, but you can see some trough cross bedding. They're very broad coming down. Now, these aren't great and they're not definitive, but those seem to indicate that they might have been Aeolian sort of sand dune deposits. Now, this is not atypical for the Jurassic. In fact, there's a number of other formations that are very arid, like the Entrada, which is a Jurassic unit below us, that has very big, broad sand dune-like features. The Morrison was probably uh, wetter than the Entrada. We don't get that. But we do get some cross bedding indicating some Aeolian sand dune type activity. We also have these rivers that have the cobbles in them, and we have the paleosoils indicating vegetation. So we had kind of a, a very uh, heterogeneous, very mixed sort of environment. Um, but none of the things are indicating that it was a marshy, boggy environment. We don't see coal, and that's what you typically see in a marsh like deposit. Um, coal or like especially if it was a very swampy place um, which you do see in the Cretaceous but we don't see it in the Jurassic so it's probably dry all right we got a dinosaur bone look at how big it is this is huge it's probably like a femur maybe a tibia this would be like the knee joint down here maybe it's difficult to say we're missing some of this but then it goes in it probably goes in a couple couple more feet that way we got some bone down here, and uh, we even got some bone up in here, uh, this dinosaur. So it's in this big quartz conglomerate, um, probably drifted downstream. So it's got some damage over here. You can see this end is not completely uh, preserved, but this is just a, a beautiful dinosaur. So this is one of the big sauropod dinosaurs. It might have been a Patasaurus or Diplodocus or even Barasaurus. Um, there are quite a few large sauropod dinosaurs in the Morrison Formation. And these rock ledges like this are perfect for looking for uh, dinosaur bones. And here we have a beautiful dinosaur bone. We found a dinosaur! I know it doesn't look like much, but this piece right here is uh, some dinosaur bone sticking out. This is the compact coracal bone and this is the spongy inner bone. It's probably a rib it looks like sticking out. Let's see if we can find some more. This is kind of a great view. Um, so right behind me here's this ridge which is our sandstone um, right here and then behind me is some more Morrison and probably then the Cedar Mountains up here at some point. And so we have this valley here that's the mudstones, that's the paleosoils. So you can see that there's quite a bit of different lithologies within the Morrison Formation. I think that's one of the reasons too, as many geologists who are not necessarily particularly interested in the dinosaurs themselves and trying to figure out the environment that they lived in, are interested in the Morrison Formation because it is such a um, varying lithology and varying rock layers within kind of a similar habitat or similar depositional system, I should say. So this is Island Park. It's one of the most beautiful places in all of Utah. Um, we're looking down on the Green River and off to our north is the uh, Morrison Formation, fabulous deposits of Morrison Formation exposed here in, uh, in Utah. All right, so we're at uh, the Dinosaur Quarry in Dinosaur National Park, 
and this quarry building uh, was constructed in 2012 so it's only five years old and it encloses a rock face uh, that was the sort of remnants of the quarry of the dinosaurs that they didn't extract um, they extracted quite a few dinosaurs from this walk rock face uh, beginning in 1909 um, working until 19 i think 1997 uh, was when they stopped um, exposing uh, dinosaur bones in this rock face uh, most of this hillside was actually dug out and excavated in the 1930s um, and uh, and then in the 1950s they built a building to enclose it that building started to fall apart and so in 2006 they took that building down and they built this brand new building that encloses this rock face uh, where we will see wonderful dinosaur bones one of the things that's really interesting about this area is that the rocks are tilted at about 45 degrees. So the Morrison Formation is tilted. And that means when we go inside the building, the rock face is tilted up with all the dinosaur bones exposed on that tilted rock surface. So let's go in in. Hey, there's a bone, kind of like what we found. But now all prepared and put back together. So this dinosaur here is a cast of a Camarasaurus, a juvenile Camarasaurus that was discovered um, and sent back to Pittsburgh to the Carnegie Museum. But this is a cast that's on display uh, in front of the rock face. And this here is a cast of an Allosaurus. And this right here is the quarry map. And the area in red is what's currently on display at Dinosaur National Monument. And the white part of the quarry map is stuff that was excavated. And so this is Earl Douglas's initial discovery. And all of these bones have been articulated and placed in various museums. Uh, most of them probably back at the Carnegie Museum in Pittsburgh. So one of the interesting things, kind of a little side note about the quarry itself, is that um, there's actually more in the Morrison Formation that are exposed along this feature. So this is a sandstone channel that was deposited probably by rivers based on the sedimentation, um, the cross bedding, the, those uh, coarse grains or pebbles, conglomeratic layers, um, like many other little fluvial systems that come into the Morrison Formation. Anyway, it was preserved along this band and this ridge was much, much higher when they were excavating it. Then they made a parking lot and they actually excavated the other side and it was a big ridge. But if you turn around and look on the other side, over here, we have another ridge. Actually, it's this one down here, right down in there. And that ridge there is also contains dinosaur bones. So, you know, if you wanted to, and you wanted to come up and do a lot of, a lot of work, if they wanted to, they could Provide, excavate all of these uh, rock faces over here and probably find hundreds of more dinosaurs um, although you're looking at a hundred years of work as well uh, to expose all those and there's quite a bit of overburden over there so you're talking a major operation um, but there's lots of dinosaur bones here for the future <laughs> 